Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Susie Gelman, and I'm privileged to serve as the board chair of Israel Policy Forum. I want to welcome those of you who are joining Israel Policy Forum for the first time today, and welcome back our returning viewers. Before we begin, I want to thank our supporters. Our work, including today's program, is made possible by you. If you don't yet support our work, please do so by visiting israelpolicyforum.org forward slash support. Now on to today's briefing. Foreign Minister Yair Lapid has announced that Israel will co-sponsor and vote for a UN General Assembly resolution condemning Russian, Russia's investigation, invasion sorry, of Ukraine. But given the importance of Israel's ties with Russia, particularly in the realm of security cooperation, its stance on the Ukraine crisis has been far from unequivocal. Prime Minister Naftali Bennett's statements have refrained from condemning Russia, even as he has expressed sympathy for the Ukrainian people. To assess Israel's diplomatic strategy on this conflict and how the developing situation in Ukraine will affect Israel's security and international relations, we are joined today by Eran Etzion, a non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute, former deputy head of Israel's National Security Council, and the former head of policy planning at Israel's foreign ministry. As always, we welcome your questions. Please type them in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. A recording of this broadcast will be published later on our website at israelpolicyforum.org forward slash briefings. With that, Elan, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, it's a pleasure. Uh, please provide us with some background before the lead up to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. What was the state of Israel's relations with both countries? How has Israel's official position on the Ukraine crisis developed over the course of the past few weeks and certainly the past few days leading up to Russia's invasion? Well, <clears throat> frankly, I think it's not the right frame to look at this conflict as a Rus Russian-Ukrainian conflict. It's obviously much bigger than that. So when we look at the background and the lead off to this confrontation, we needn't necessarily look at, for example, Israel-Ukraine bilateral relations, which frankly has always been, how shall we put it diplomatically, kind of tertiary in its importance relative to other bilateral relations. It's not as if we had any kind of special relations with the Ukrainians or that it featured in any, let's say, cabinet discussion any time in the last, I don't know how many decades in Israel's history. Russia, of course, is a totally different story. Russia has had for many years what might describe as very complex relations. And I might, and I might even share a little personal story here. Back in uh, 2005, I was nominated as deputy head of the NSC, as you said. Uh, Ariel Sharon, the late Sharon, was then the prime minister. And it was the first time that Putin ever came to Israel. And he had a one-on-one -on -one with Sharon. And as I'm sure our viewers all know or heard of, Sharon wasn't necessarily a person that was deterred or alarmed very easily. However, after this meeting, he was alarmed. And he summoned us and asked us to do a special project on Putin and uh, Russia more generally and our bilateral relations with Russia. That was because he understood viscerally that he doesn't understand. That what he usually thought of as his ability to kind of connect with foreign leaders, uh, interact with them and understand their kind of inner workings. In this case, he felt obviously correctly that it didn't really work. So he wanted us to do some investigative uh, project for him, which we did for three months. It was my first project as a deputy head. Fascinating project, by the way, that culminated in uh, something like 80 pages uh, PowerPoint presentation that was presented to cabinet, but unfortunately was not presented to Sharon because he uh, fell ill shortly after. So it was presented to Olmert sitting as a, as a stand-in prime minister before the elections. And uh, without sharing all the conclusions, because obviously it was a top secret uh, project, uh, 
our understanding at the time was that contrary to popular convention, Israel and Russia do share a lot of common interests uh, on, on multiple fronts, shall we put it this way. This was obviously long before the Syrian civil war and all of that, but nevertheless, we had a, a very interesting kind of uh, list, um, grocery list, if you will, of, of joint interests that Russia and Israel share, alongside, of course, many other columns in which uh, Russia and Israel Russia and Israel's interests uh, completely collide. So there is a long history. Uh, and if we fast forward to the recent months and weeks, uh, I think there was an overall assessment in Israel, uh, perhaps unlike the assessment in Washington, that uh, Putin will not uh, go all the way with, uh, with invasion into Ukraine. And uh, now famously, it was leaked to all the Israeli press Lieberman, who has very close connections, shall we put it this way, special connections to perhaps not Putin himself, but to the very immediate circle of Putin, which for every intelligence, uh, Western intelligence organization, including Israel's intelligence, is an unpenetrable black box. Uh, Lieberman does have special relations with, with some of these guys. And he uh, allegedly told the Israeli cabinet that, you know, nothing's going to happen. He said, uh, you know, Martians will invade the earth before Putin will invade Ukraine, quote unquote. So uh, there was a lot of uh, misperception, shall we put it this way, in the Israeli cabinet, and I guess in, in other cabinets probably as well. Um, and uh, therefore they were caught by surprise. So that's, I think, the, the first thing to realize. It was a strategic surprise for everyone. And you asked about uh, channels of communication. As I'm sure, again, our viewers know, this is a new government uh, comprised basically of uh, foreign policy novices, uh, both Prime Minister Bennett, Foreign Minister Lapid, uh, Lieberman himself, even though he was foreign minister, was pretty much a pariah in every Western uh, capital, including Washington. He doesn't really have for a foreign policy experience in, in that regard. And neither does essentially anyone else uh, around the cabinet table, unfortunately. Um, and they do not really communicate with Netanyahu. It's not as if, you know, uh, perhaps under normal circumstances, they would have summoned the former prime minister and consulted with him and so on. But that is not the political situation that we have here. So to a large extent, um, these, uh, the, the, they enter the conflict with uh, too little experience, let's put it this way. Um, and they had to improvise. So I think at least part of what we're seeing is, uh, is improvisation. And this is why, uh, for example, you see uh, something of a gap between the line that Prime Minister Bennett is taking and the line that uh, Foreign Minister uh, Lapid is taking. Some people allege that, this, that it is fully coordinated. I personally doubt it. I think it reflects uh, differences in uh, worldview uh, in, and in uh, exposure to uh, diplomacy. And naturally, because Lapid is now foreign minister and also, of course, future prime minister, uh, according to the agreement, in, in less than two years, is supposed to be to replace Bennett as prime minister. He is much more sensitive to the international arena, international interests than uh, Bennett and those other persons in the cabinet, uh, some of whom I already mentioned. So uh, you do have this tension, which is reflected in the public statements and might even get uh, more severe. For example, uh, Lapid's, uh, some of Lapid's latest uh, uh, statements today touched upon the very sensitive issue of sanctions and the question of whether or not Israel will join the international sanctions. Um, something that I'm quite sure uh, all cabinet ministers would very much like to avoid, not only to avoid uh, joining the sanctions, but even avoid discussing it certainly publicly. But unfortunately, they, they're behind the curve. Uh, I think uh, if, I, if I had to kind of um, try to describe in, in one item what is, the, what is happening now in the Israeli government, I, I would say they're behind. They're badly behind. Again, one can understand, you know, these are historic events. Nobody really 
is able to comprehend it fully in real time. It's, it's uh, astonishing the way the pace and the scope of developments, it's understandable. Plus the fact, as, as I already said, they're all novices. Nevertheless, they, they are behind and I think it's, it's worrying. And they should have caught up by now and I hope they will. And by catching up, I mean, obviously aligning with uh, Israel's natural allies, the US, the, the European countries and the uh, largely speaking, the democratic bloc. And what we're seeing instead is a lot of, uh, uh, shall we say, um, stomach aches that are externalized, in, again, in a, in a way that reflects badly on, on Israel and Israel's image, um, mixing what I call tactical operational considerations with real strategic considerations. And by this, I, I mean, first and foremost, the issue of the so-called freedom of maneuver of, of, uh, Israel, of IAF, Israeli Air Force planes over Syria, which is presented as the number one consideration that prevents us from allegedly from aligning with the West. Uh, I think this is uh, number one, mixing you know, secondary considerations with real strategic ones. Secondly, ignoring the fact that uh, long before Putin had, had relations with Israel, diplomatic relations. He was already in bed with Iran, Syria, and many other of Israel's enemy, enemies, and he still is. Uh, and the fact that we uh, need to uh, attack targets in Syria is very much thanks to Putin and the fact that he allows it to happen. So it's really strange, I have to say, that these kinds of calculations are being made and are so pervasive in, in Israeli thinking. I think it has to do with two factors. One is the strength of the um, military, uh, defense military lobby, shall we say, within the Israeli cabinet and the wider echelons of uh, the Israeli political system. Um, and again, some of it might be understandable. They perhaps just justifiably are looking at the strategic picture first and foremost via the uh, the angle of uh, those responsible for attacking Israel's enemies uh, along the borders, but it shouldn't uh, dominate strategic thinking. And it's not, again, unfortunately, the first time that this happens in Israel. It's, it's quite common across governments, but it's happening again. And the second element has to do with Netanyahu's legacy and Netanyahu's ongoing influence over Israeli politics and over uh, this government's, at least some, if not most of this government's uh, leaders. And mo many of their calculations are impacted by the question of you know, what would Netanyahu do and how would Netanyahu react if we deviate from what he would have done. Mm -hmm. And so far, with the exception of Lapid, none of them deviated from what Netanyahu would have done. Um, if Netanyahu were in power now, he would implement the exact same policy that they implemented so far. He would uh, try very hard not to irritate Putin. He would explain on and off record that we have these special relations and we must protect our freedom to, of maneuver and so on and so forth. He would also say that, you know, this is not our war to fight. Let them fight their own wars. Um, he would disassociate himself as much as he could from uh, American Democrats which he did as he was, uh, when he was prime minister, as we all remember. And he's still, again, if he were sitting, uh, a sitting prime minister, he would uh, overtly and covertly hope for and work for Trump's return. So we would see very much the same policy with perhaps some minor exceptions that are attributable to Lapid. Uh, the fact that we are eventually uh, aligning with the U.S. in the upcoming U.N. vote after many deliberations and hesitations. Um, and, uh, and the fact that we are considering joining the sanctions. Um, so that's more or less kind of an overview of, of where we are. If it's not understood so far, then I would just uh, close this answer by saying, <clears throat> that I think the government is pretty much mistaken in, in the way it is approaching this issue. Um, I do see some encouraging signs in the Israeli political discourse, which started out uh, a week or two ago uh, in complete alignment 
with the kind of Netanyahu thinking that I just portrayed. Uh, again, it has its kind of structural reasons. A lot of the uh, correspondents, analysts, commentators that are sitting in the uh, TV studios and writing for the major newspapers and so on are still very much in Netanyahu, either a Netanyahu legacy or very much working with the defense establishment or both. So their thinking is shaped along those lines. And they were very much emphasizing the Syrian issue and you know, let us not uh, cross Putin and so on and so forth. But it is gradually changing, perhaps also thanks to the fact that uh, some of them were sent to the, to the front in Ukraine and are influenced by, by what they're seeing there. Um, perhaps uh, all sorts of American and, and uh, other European pressures that are having some effect. But I, I detect, I think, a minor movement in the public opinion. Um, and also perhaps uh, even, even more minor in the, uh, in the government's position. And it's very unfortunate because I do think that ultimately, in the same way that they completely rejected or rebuffed the US request that Israel sponsor the uh, text for the UNSC resolution uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, again, a big mistake that infuriated the Americans and justifiably so. And now they're, they're gonna vote for the same text in the General Assembly. And in the same way, while now they're rejecting any kind of notion of joining the sanctions, they will join the sanctions because they will have to. And it's not a question of if, it's a question of how and to what extent. And we became, unfortunately, very good at doing the right thing only after exhausting all other options. And it's happening again. Well, Elon, thank you for that very sobering overview. Uh, let's jump in a little bit uh, deeper here. Israel has announced that it will be providing humanitarian aid, including medical supplies, to Ukraine. But Prime Minister Bennett declined President Zelensky's request for military aid. There have also been calls for Israel to mediate between Ukraine and Russia. How has Israel been engaging with both Ukraine and Russia since the invasion began? And how does it envision its role going forward in the conflict? Let's separate between the issue of humanitarian aid and the issue of the so-called uh, uh, mediation effort. Humanitarian aid is kind of the lowest level of support that is expected from a country like Israel. We are always very proud of uh, humanitarian aid that we provide across the world in all sorts of uh, uh, more minor conflicts. And it's only to be expected that we would uh, assist humanitarianly for in such a global conflict on European continent. It, it, should, it should go without saying. Um, and it's fine. And the more we can do in that regard, the better. Uh, I just, uh, I just read that the uh, European Union is now sending half a billion dollar, worth, half a billion euros, sorry, worth of humanitarian aid to Ukraine and probably send much more. So Israel will probably do more than it already has and it should do and, and that's fine. And that's kind of, again, the, the easiest, um, um, less problematic uh, diplomatic line that any country can take. The issue of so-called mediation is very different. Uh, and uh, I think it's very much a hoax. There was never any chance of Israeli mediation in that conflict, either under this government or under the former government. And we now know that Netanyahu tried to push himself into this mediating role when he was prime minister. And Bennett, unfortunately, as I already said, is trying to follow in Netanyahu's footsteps uh, almost across the board on, a, on any kind of policy. And it has tried to do it here too. And I think mistakenly, Israel has no business in doing it. And it's a farce. I can only imagine Putin's real reaction uh, between himself and his lieutenants when, when he received this request. He looks at Israel and, and it doesn't really matter who the prime minister is, Netanyahu, Bennett, whoever. He looks at us as an American proxy. And justifiably so from his perspective. There is no way that he would allow such a, an American proxy to mediate in such a sensitive conflict. The only way that he is not rejecting it immediately is number one, that he probably enjoys playing. And, and number two, that he doesn't care. You know, If Israel volunteers to distance itself 
from its natural ally and to uh, um, kind of uh, snub the US by taking this kind of independent line, of course, you wouldn't stop it. But there's nothing to it in, in substantial terms. Israel is not in a position to mediate. It has no leverage on either side. It doesn't really have the trust, certainly not of Putin, and I doubt very much that it has the trust of Zelensky. Um, so it's just uh, theatrics. It's not strategy and it's not policy. As uh, you mentioned, uh, Israel is planning on voting in favor of a UN resolution condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Can you talk a little bit about the significance of this development, although I think you already sort of indicated that you think Israel kind of got backed into that corner. Um, but does it mean that Israel is picking a side in this conflict? And do you anticipate that Israel will take additional steps in opposition to Russia? So um, it only means that Israel found itself pushed into a corner where it didn't really have an option. We couldn't really um, do what we did uh, shall we say, in, uh, in 2014, after the Crimea invasion. I don't know how many of our viewers remember, but Israel at the time, obviously under Netanyahu, um, the uh, UN ambassador was instructed not only not to vote with the US and the West, and not only even to abstain, but to abandon the premises. And uh, he, he simply wasn't present for the vote which I thought at the time was shameful, and also in retrospect is, is shameful, but this, is, this, this was Netanyahu's policy at the time. Um, so th this time around, given the magnitude of the conflict, given the fact that you know, this is a democratic administration and it's a novice Israeli prime minister, there was really no option but to uh, align with the US and the West and, and vote against Russia. So that's gonna happen. What will happen next and to what extent Israel will further align with the US and, and uh, the democratic bloc? And to what extent will it or will it not join the sanctions and so forth? I have to say remains to be seen. I wouldn't, I wouldn't kind of draw a direct line from this vote onto more and more uh, similar steps, unfortunately. Uh, you're already seeing, those of you who are following closely, you can see kind of the line of, uh, of uh, leaks that traces back obviously to the prime minister's office and, and other ministries that is already apologizing for this future vote and saying things like, well, we didn't really have a choice. If it were up to us, we wouldn't do it, but you know, please understand we had no choice and uh, the Americans are, are pressuring us and so on apologizing for this vote rather than you know, taking pride in it and saying we're doing the right thing. We are the uh, carriers of, of Jewish history and Jewish memory and so on. And obviously there's no question where, how, what should we do in such a circumstance? This is not the line the government is taking. Again, with the exception of Lapid. But Bennett and the, uh, the other ministers are quiet, but they obviously talk to the press all the time. And the overall impression is that you have Bennett and all cabinet ministers, or at least key government ministers, who are abiding by this much more conservative, uh, kind of a careful line. And on the other hand, you have Lapid, who is uh, more into, shall we say, alignment with the US and, and uh, the Democratic Bloc. So my next question was going to focus on Bennett and Lapid, and you, you, you've spoken already uh, a lot about their different approaches, but I think, I, I guess I have two questions. One, they are clearly not on the same page on this issue. Do you see any, for lack of a better word, rapprochement between the two of them where they come to some kind of consensus or you think they're just going to each stick to their positions? And then what effect does that have on, on the coalition for the two coalition leaders who have been heretofore working pretty well together, even though they obviously have very divergent political views on a number of issues. Is this a uh, disagreement, for lack of a better way of putting it, going to stress the coalition or is it stressing the coalition? Well, this may sound a little bit contrary to what I said before, but I think by and large, those two uh, individuals do have 
um, relations of trust and understanding. Um, they depend on each other, literally. Uh, Lapid's political future is in the hands of Bennett. Bennett's term as prime minister is also contingent on Lapid's goodwill. And, and they both understand it. So, and for politicians, obviously nothing is more important than keeping their positions when you, when you speak about a prime minister and the future prime minister. So they do work together. And while they do not necessarily see eye to eye on every issue, and this issue is one of them, I don't think that this will have a political effect on the future of the coalition. Uh, Israeli coalitions will, will not fall, have not fallen, and will not fall on uh, foreign policy issues. Uh, if, if at all, they would fall on, on different issues, much more, shall we say, uh, petty and, and partisan and so on. Um, so I don't think it will strain the coalition. Um, we have to qualify that by looking at uh, the dimension of time. And here, there is obviously a huge question mark. Nobody knows how long this conflict will continue. Nobody knows what kind of uh, extra dimensions and extensions it, it will uh, uh, take. Everything is possible at this point. You know, nobody believed uh, just a few weeks ago that we will arrive where we have already arrived. So one has to be very careful. But um, if I kind of discount extreme scenarios of, uh, I don't know, a third world war or uh, on the one hand, or uh, I don't know, I can, you know, we, we needn't fantasize. But absent any kind of more extreme scenarios, let's put it this way, if we do have the current trajectory in terms of, you know, the world splitting into two blocks, uh, the US, Europe, and its uh, like-minded countries on the one hand, Russia, China, Iran, Syria, uh, and, and the likes on the other, <clears throat> and uh, the world kind of adjusting to this new reality. Uh, I think this is such a powerful uh, historical moment with, uh, with really incredible magnitude of implications that we it will overpower any other uh, kind of local consideration of any Israeli politician. And it will push them together. Uh, and and uh, it will probably enlarge the sustainability and, and durability of this government. Um, another thing we have to mention in that respect is obviously the upcoming agreement in Vienna between Iran and the P5 plus one, which again, uh, at least in my mind, is now, um, its probability has lessened to a certain extent. I was willing to bet that there will be an agreement uh, until a week ago. Now I would might still bet it, but with, uh, with uh, fewer odds. Uh, I think uh, Iran's every, every single actor's calculation, strategic calculation has now dramatically changed. And that includes Iran. Uh, and under the new circumstances, they might not have as much of, a, of an incentive to sign as they did a week ago. Um, so, and this will have an, a, a more, shall we say, direct impact on Israeli politics um, and on the coalition, potentially. Because if we don't have an agreement and if things deteriorate um, and Israel finds itself, um, shall we say, battling against the entire world on the Iranian issue, um, this will be a huge opportunity for Netanyahu comeback. Uh, and, and it will have a, a significant impact on, on Israeli politics, which is hard to, to foresee at this point. But it will strain the coalition more than shall we say, um, other potential developments in, in Ukraine. Uh, I do want to remind our audience, if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box and we will get to as many of them as we can. Uh, Iran, you talked earlier about Israel relying on security coordination with Russia in order to conduct airstrikes in Syria against Hezbollah, Syrian and Israeli Iranian targets, which is critical for ensuring Israel's security on the northern front. Many point to this as the most significant constraint Israel faces in taking a stand on Ukraine. 
So what would it take for Israel to anger Putin to the point that Russia would end this security cooperation? And what else does Israel have to lose in its relationship with Russia? Well, as I said earlier, I do think there's a um, tremendous amount of exaggeration going into the debate on this particular point of the so-called freedom of maneuver of, uh, of Israeli airplanes in Syrian skies. And I'll try to explain. Number one, we have attacked Syrian targets uh, long before Russia was present in Syria. Um, we have attacked before. We continued to attack before we had this uh, hotline between the two militaries. And if Putin decides to cut it off, we will be able to continue and, and hit targets in Syria. Yes, it will be less convenient. Yes, it will be perhaps more dangerous, but it will still be possible. Number two, um, I think Putin will think twice before he changes the status quo uh, on this front. He has multiple reasons. He had multiple reasons to help create this status quo. He wasn't doing a favor to Israel. He's doing it because this is exactly the correct balance for him, the perfect balance between his various interests in Syria. He, his number one interest is to make sure that Assad remains in control. Um, and of course, that Russia has as much influence as possible and maintains its, its strategic, newly gained strategic assets in Syria, which are essentially the uh, Hamimim uh, seaport and the strategic military base that they have been able, the, the bridgehead, if you will, that they have been able to create in the Middle East, thanks to the Syrian civil war and to Putin's strategic genius of sending a, a relatively very small military force at the right time. Uh, and being able essentially to tip the balance of the war towards Assad. <clears throat> so as long as this remains the case, and it will remain the case, uh, no matter what Israel does, um, he's satisfied. Number two, he, he wants Iran to be present in Syria, because in, in, if, you, if we look at his strategic alliance with Iran, which he has and has had for a long time, and it continues to, to, uh, to forge, and I think one of the, um, shall we say, more alarming developments that will result from this current Ukrainian conflict will be the uh, more strong alignment of Russia and Iran. Because Russia now will have fewer and fewer friends, fewer and fewer uh, diplomatic relations and so on, and more incentive to project power in the Middle East and elsewhere. And this fits perfectly with Iran's strategic goals. So I think there will be more and more alignment. Now, Israel, in terms of its, uh, its own strategic goals in Syria, if I, I remind our viewers, Netanyahu put it very succinctly when he said, our goal is to eliminate Iranian presence in Syria. This was never an achievable goal, even though he, he repeated it multiple times. Uh, it was clear that it's unachievable, but he insisted. And this goal obviously was not attained, and it will not be attained by this government or any Israeli government. So when we look at it from a strategic perspective, despite hundreds and hundreds of uh, Israeli strikes on Iranian targets in Syria, the strategic goal not only was not uh, attained, nothing even close to the strategic goal was attained. Yes, we were able to hit them. Yes, we were able to slow down their effort. But ultimately, Iran is there as strong as ever, and its strategic plan marches on. So what happens if we are not able or less able to hit Iranian targets in Syria? I don't want to be too blunt, but it amounts to almost nothing. Strategically, it amounts to almost nothing. This is not a popular view, but, but this is my view. But even if uh, one uh, gives it more, shall we say, strategic weight, Again, repeating what I said earlier, putting it uh, against the much, much, much bigger and deeper and historical and long-term interests that we have in terms of aligning with the US and the West, I really see no comparison. So we should, if indeed there's a hit to be taken, we should take it. Um, of course, be careful not to uh, create a situation where we have direct friction with Russian forces over Syria or elsewhere, this is not our interest. I believe it's also not the, the Russian interest. So there's a large 
that there's a good chance that it will that it will not happen. Um, and and that's what I would say about that. Now, I think the question was: to what extent can we uh, might we aggravate Putin, and what will happen in a in a as a result, right? So and, and and even what would it take for Israel to actually lose its relationship with Russia? I don't think we lose our relations with Russia. I'm, sh should I say fortunately or unfortunately? I'm not sure. <clears throat> um, but um, I don't think it will amount to that. Uh, I think Putin has an interest in in maintaining at least some degree of relations with us. Um, again, his thinking is is completely kind of anti-American in a strategic sense. And for him, being able to um, demonstrate in some sort of important relations with Israel, um, even though Israel is so much aligned with the US, was a success. So it's not a card that he would simply like to throw away. Uh, I think he would like to maintain it. Yes, of course, if Israel will align, the more Israel will align with the US kind of openly, the more he will retaliate openly in the way that he already started. Uh, immediately after we said that we would vote with the US, he released a statement against Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights, calling it the Tel Aviv government and so on. So in terms of rhetoric, you might see things like that. But in, in real strategic terms, um, he will continue, I think, to play the game that he has, which for him was perfectly calibrated. On the one hand, having diplomatic relations with Israel, having this uh, tactical operational co coordination in Syria, while aligning more and more with Iran, with Assad, uh, and taking care of his, uh, of his other interests, more important interests with, uh, with Israel's worst enemies. Uh, Elon, in several instances, US sanctions against Russia have also put Israel in a difficult position. For example, prominent Israeli institutions, including Yad Vashem, Sheba Medical Center, and Tel Aviv University, have all sent letters to Ambassador Tom Nides to avoid sanctioning Roman Abramovich, a Russian Israeli billionaire, oligarch, and prominent Jewish donor who's also close to President Putin due to his, quote, contributions to the Jewish people, end quote. Bearing in mind that these institutions do not represent the Israeli government, does this disagreement suggest that Israel may not be fully on board with the U.S. response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Yes, it does. And Israel is not fully on board. And that's clear, unfortunately. But uh, this is a very important point that I want to elaborate on a little bit. Um, this whole business of uh, Russian-Israeli oligarchs that have fled to Israel over the years <clears throat> and have taken residence here in all sorts of shady ways um is uh hopefully uh, i should say it perhaps carefully but hopefully will now be uh, looked at with fresh eyes <clears throat> these guys um, um are using israel as a base for all sorts of shady operations financial and otherwise uh, and i know i'm generalizing and you know not all of them are the same but generally speaking um and i think American sanctions, European sanctions uh, on these individuals, such as Abramovich and others, are actually a good opportunity for Israel to reverse course and uh, start treating these, uh, these uh, special kinds of super empowered individuals uh, in a very different way. And uh, I'm not necessarily saying that, you know, we should strip them of their uh, artificial Israeli uh, citizenship, but we should definitely um, not be an exception to global sanctions if indeed they are, uh, they are slapped with such, san such san sanctions. And of course, when it comes to venerable institutions like Yad Vashem and others, they must refrain from taking any kind of donations from uh, these kinds of uh, uh, dirty money tycoons. And, uh, and this should be the new standard should have been the standard uh, from the beginning, but now there's an opportunity to do it under pressure and, and it should be done by every Israeli institution, including the Tel Aviv University, Yad Vashem and all others. And the fact that they, for now at least, are taking the exact opposite course and appealing to the Americans 
not to sanction these individuals. He's a real sheikh. And just as a follow-up on that, are you seeing anything in terms of Israeli public opinion on this point? You know, it's interesting. I don't know where Israeli public opinion stands on these issues. I think most people probably don't have an opinion. They don't know. Uh, for them, you know, perhaps with the exception of Abramovich, who has a very high profile, uh, those others oligarchs are, uh, are very well connected, but they keep a very low profile. They probably know why. Um, so the average Israeli would not even have an opinion. Um, and I think the more there is an exposure or, uh, um, you know, lifting the, the curtain um, from these individuals and their past and their present and uh, their alignment with Putin and all of that, uh, I think Israeli public opinion would, uh, would uh, adjust, let's put it this way. But in this case, I'm not sure Israeli public opinion is, is the real factor. It should be the government. <clears throat> and again, I go back to this uh, project that I did back in 2005. I also looked into those oligarchs. Um, and uh, let's, I, I need to be diplomatic here, but uh, I, I was negatively surprised by what I saw. Um, and I was at the time also uh, in contact with Israeli police, uh, the international branch of Israeli police, who told me a little bit about their background and so on. And uh, it was clear that this is not the kind of uh, um, the kind of individuals that uh, a democratic, a liberal democratic country should be happy to to host and uh, naturalize and so on. <clears throat> and um, unfortunately, it attests to a degree of corruption uh, within the Israeli administration. Um, and hopefully, we now have an opportunity to take care of both of, both of these individuals and the monies that they allegedly have in Israeli banks. Um, and and I, I do look at this as, a, as an interesting opportunity emanating from this uh, sad crisis. So I guess you would leave open the possibility that Israeli banks might... Uh... I think there's a good chance. You know, Israeli banks are very uh, responsive to international pressures. They already paid tremendous fines, for example, uh, you know, as, uh, for those of us who are following it, for all sorts of uh, shady operations in the US and in Israel uh, after the 2008 crisis, and uh, some of them are still paying for it. So I think, uh, I know for a fact that they're very sensitive to international pressures and international sanctions, especially coming from the US. And to the extent that there will be, for example, personal sanctions <clears throat> on a person like Abramovich, Israeli banks will, will abide by them long before the government will. Okay, um, I'm gonna to turn to some audience questions. We have a number and I wanna to try to get to a few of them at least. So Donald Schwartz asks, what is Israeli government policy on Ukrainian Jews coming to Israel as refugees? It's a good question. Um, I think it's also evolving uh, virtually as we speak. Unfortunately, again, the way most Israeli immigration, most if not all of Israeli immigration policies are shaped, and this goes along decades, <clears throat> backwards, I'm sorry, decades, um, there is a very clear cut distinction between the way we uh, treat Jews or eligible Jews according to the law of return and the way we treat any other um, refugees or, uh, or other people uh, seeking entry into Israel. And uh, we usually are very suspicious vis-a-vis -vis those who belong to the second category. And unfortunately, Ukrainians in that conflict are not an exception. Uh, there was just today some uh, media noise about this point because again, for those who didn't see, the U Ukrainian ambassador in Israel complained uh, with tears that uh, dozens of Ukrainians trying to enter Israel were rebuffed uh, after uh, refusing all sorts of demands to uh, deposit tens of thousands of shekels that they don't have as a guarantee or something like that. And then uh, Ayelet Shaked, the interior minister, who, uh, who is not known, shall we say, for its hospitability towards refugees, uh, 
<clears throat> uh, had to uh, release a reaction saying that only 97 Ukrainians uh, tried to enter Israel today and only two were refused uh, on justified uh, grounds, one of them with uh, fake identity and the other, I don't remember. So uh, there's already some pressure mounting both from outside and, and inside Israel, uh, trying to push the government into a much more open door uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukrainian refugees. But the kind of instinctive tendency, bureaucratic and political and so on, is not necessary to open the doors for those who are not Jews or not eligible, uh, according to the uh, law of return. So uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's good to continue uh, kind of mounting these pressures and making sure that Israel uh, adapts again and aligns its policies on Ukrainian refugees with the policies of uh, European countries. This is a time of crisis. They should be granted entry without too many questions. Uh, and one didn't even make analogies to Jews in the Second World War, which again, the Ukrainian ambassador today was making. <clears throat> he said so many Ukrainians helped so many Jews during the Holocaust, so what are you doing and so on. And we don't need to get there. It's simply the, the kind of right thing to do. Open the doors. Don't ask too many questions. Of course, if somebody has a fake identity, send him back, but otherwise, open the doors. So we have a question from Murray Rubin that kind of is a follow-up to what you just said, that he says, Ukraine was nearly the most anti-Semitic country during the Second World War. Does this have an effect on Israeli policy? It does. Um, and, and you know, there are arguments pro and against this kind of uh, image of, of the Ukraine, which I don't want to go into. And I think there's a limit to uh, historic uh, kind of uh, bookkeeping in that regard. And those Ukrainians uh, alive today and fleeing Putin shouldn't necessarily be held accountable to crimes that were committed uh, you know, in the early 20th or mid 20th century. Um, so while I do see why many people kind of look at this uh, particular issue with these kinds of glasses, at least personally, I, I, I try not to do it. Um, and uh, there's also no kind of uh, anti-Semitic uh, COVID test kind of that, that you can take and, uh, at the Ben-Gurion airport and, and check for uh, anti-Semitic tendencies. So um, I don't think it should have a kind of um, practical impact on, on our policies today, certainly not when it comes to uh, hosting refugees. Uh, moving to a different issue, Eric Selkov asks, uh, how will the reduction of Ukraine grain being exported to the Middle East affect the Middle East? And I guess Israel specifically. I'm, I'm not sure I got it again, sorry. Okay, but, the, we're, we're talking about the export of wheat from Ukraine. Ah, right, right, yes. One of the bread baskets, one of the premier right. bread baskets of the world. How will that affect uh, the Middle East with that reduction in, in this very important yes. commodity? It will have an impact for sure, um, not only on Israel, but also on Israel uh, and other countries in the Middle East. Yes, um, I, it, it's hard to tell you know, to what extent, uh, and it's obviously not replaceable very easily. Uh, wheat takes time to grow. It's not oil that you can you know, increase the, the output uh, immediately. So it will have an impact, prices will rise, they're already rising. Um, it, it might uh, have uh, negative political effects on countries like Egypt, Lebanon and others that are importers of Ukrainian wheat. Uh, in Israel, it will not come to that because we have you know, enough reserves and uh, we're able to, to buy wheat even if the price is much higher. But so I think it's not so much an Israel proper issue. It is definitely a Middle East wide issue. Um, and, uh, and it's a good point. And I think it's very hard to, in the short run, it's going to be very hard to compensate for. Are there other countries that can fill the gap? Frankly, I don't know. Uh, and I doubt it because you're talking about a huge scale. And there was a certain market balance. The market balance was immediately kind of. Uh, um, upset, and uh, and it's not uh, it's not easily or, or immediately uh, uh, mendable. 
A uh, separate question from Stephen M. He says, I'm skeptical that the sanctions will have much of an effect or impact. Am I being realistic? And what do you think? You are being realistic, but uh, um, but we are in uncharted territory. Uh, there's really no comparison to the level of sanction that Russia is now taking, um, not in terms of the severity and the kind of scope of sanctions in terms of virtually any uh, Western country or OECD country uh, taking part in it um, against such a huge economy as Russia. We have the Iranian uh, experience, but it's very different, obviously. The, the scale is different. The, the scope of sanctions is different. So we don't really have a, a precedent. Um, and I'm, I have to say I'm very impressed with the sanctions effort. I'm, I'm positively surprised. I didn't think it's going to happen that fast and, and uh, reach that deep. I just read today in the New York Times, probably many of you read it also, there was a very interesting analysis of the implications of the sanctions on the Russian Central Bank. So the bottom line was that the overall reserves that the Russian bank uh, has, that Russia has essentially the central bank, are approximately 600, $680 billion. But only 12 billion out of those 680 are under Russian control. Most of the rest, approximately 400, are held in Western institutions and were frozen. And then they have another 80 billion in China and another 140 billion in gold. So the experts interviewed for this, uh, for this article, this analysis said that if it continues for a number of months, it might very well collapse the ruble and the Russian economy completely. And some of these experts cautioned rationally that we should uh, take it easy because if we if we sanction too much and too heavy it will virtually collapse the economy and who knows what putin's reaction will be so um, i think again this is uncharted territory it is already having a very severe impact you saw that uh, putin ordered all uh, all russian companies to sell all their foreign assets and buy rubles and they hiked uh, interest rates on ruble from 10 to 20 overnight, and it's just the beginning. So it's extremely, extremely impactful. And I think Putin is also surprised with the pace and, and scope of these sanctions. Um, and, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's encouraging. So one should be realistic, yes. And the realist uh, prism is that uh, it has a good chance of working. Elon, I have a couple more questions before we close at the top of the hour. One, you talked about Netanyahu's relationship with Putin, um, his admiration of Putin. I want to remind our audience that Netanyahu featured him in campaign ads, in Bibi's net campaign ads, but beyond Bibi, what about the rest of the opposition? What about the rest of Likud? Um, what's the discourse been? And are there political factions in Israel that are genuinely sympathetic to Putin independent of security concerns? Yeah, good question. Um, I think, unfortunately, there are uh, multiple analogies between the Israeli political scene and the American political scene. And uh, if you're watching Fox News, and some of you might be doing it, um, and you're watching the Israeli parallels, which are less popular and central, but they exist. We have Channel 14, for those of you who are following, which, is, which has one or 2% of rating, but uh, reflects the uh, views of the uh, Netanyahu base and the Likud base, at least most of it. And we have some other outlets, uh, and obviously over uh, social media, Twitter, Facebook, and so on. And uh, it, it really pains uh, one to see, but there are um, parts of the Israeli society that have, uh, how shall we put it, that, that their political views were twisted to so much to, to such a degree that they actually support Putin uh, over the US. It's, it's incredible, but it's, you know, it's probably as incredible as what's going on in the States. 
So always when people talk to me about, you know, how, how can this be? I always uh, kind of uh, show them the way to, to some parts of the US that, that are just as bad. Uh, but joking aside, yes, there are, uh, there is kind of a line within Likud that apologizes for Putin, that explains the rationale of Putin, that uh, blames the US and the West for not heeding Putin's uh, um, calls not to enlarge NATO, um, that uh, essentially says, you know, let, uh, let them fight each other uh, and, and let us uh, be quiet and, uh, you know, not, not get involved because this is not our business. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't have uh, the kind of uh, perhaps neo-Nazis that you see in some parts of Europe and in some parts of the state that are, you know, cheering for Putin and, uh, and stuff like that. But uh, we have something close to it, unfortunately. So quick final question. Um, and this has really been very informative. So thank you so much. Um, your expertise is just so instructive to us. Uh, looking through a Jewish lens for a moment, um, first of all, there's been an incredible outpouring in the Jewish community here of campaigning, uh, you know, campaigning for support, and, and we're talking about millions of dollars that will be going to Ukraine, to the Ukrainian Jewish community specifically, but not only, I suspect. Um, and so I'm wondering if you're seeing a counterpart effort in Israel on that front, and also Zelensky as a Jewish president, and for a time Israel and, and Ukraine shared both having a Jewish president and a Jewish prime minister. Is that a point of pride in Israel, watching this frankly formidable, courageous leader, uh, you know, try to uh, protect his country and his people? Yes, it is. Uh, and I think, again, if, if one were able to monitor Israeli public opinion and put it on, on some sort of a graph, I think you would see that while initially maybe Ukraine had some sympathy as kind of the weaker side of, of, of this uh, conflict, but without any real knowledge or any real kind of uh, familiarity, I think very quickly, thanks to social networks and the coverage of uh, Israeli media outlets and so on, you will see a, a very steep graph of uh, uh, more and more sympathy and empathy towards uh, the Ukrainians, including Zelensky personally. Um, and, and this is interesting and again, unprecedented. I don't remember anything like that. Um, some of it has to do with, uh, you know, the Jewish uh, angle of it, but I think most of it is not. Most of it is kind of uh, uh, more from the uh, liberal parts of, uh, of Israeli society. Uh, youngsters that took to the streets the other night in Rothschild Avenue in, in Tel Aviv in very surprising numbers, thousands and thousands of them. Um, and uh, people uh, following Zelensky with a lot of admiration. Uh, some of it is already in the media as well. So I think uh, the trend is absolutely towards more and more sympathy towards uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian, Ukrainian Jews, yes, but Ukrainians more generally. Zelensky as a persona, and of course, looking also at the fact that he's Jewish, but um, not sure to what extent this is a factor. It's really an admiration for, for his role in this. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I think, I think that's pretty much it. There's, there's more sympathy. sympathy. Um, what part of it uh, is connected to, you know, Jewish heritage or uh, Jew to Jew uh, affinity and so on? Not sure. On that note, I want to thank you so much, Elan, for your time and for joining us relatively last minute. I want to thank our audience for joining at the last minute because we only announced this call, I think, yesterday. Uh, so I want to thank our supporters who are with us on today's call. Again, your generosity makes programs like this one possible. And if you have not yet done so, please do consider making a contribution today at israelpolicyforum.org forward slash support. The recording of this webinar will be posted on the briefings page of our website. As always, I encourage you to subscribe to our podcast, Israel Policy Pod, sign up to receive the weekly Coplo column in your email inbox, and visit our website to access recordings of our previous briefings.
please stay tuned for an announcement regarding our next video briefing. Until then, thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Iran, Hamontoda. And I think we all are praying for the people of Ukraine. Thank you so much and uh, have a good rest of your day and evening.